Grace and peace to you and yours in the name of Jesus Christ, and welcome to Cedar Creek United Methodist Church, a church that is light, life, and love in our community, which is growing, serving, and loving all in the name of Jesus Christ. Friends, my name is Pastor Chris Beisline, and I am glad you are joining us in praise and worship today. As always, we appreciate you liking this recording on YouTube and on Facebook, and then sharing it with your friends, as this is one way we're continuing to build our online community of faith. As we prepare for worship, light your candle in your sacred space as we have already lit our candles in this holy space, and make yourself comfortable as we settle in for worship today. Now breathe in and breathe out, and let's center ourselves for worship on this third Sunday in Pentecost as we discover the ways that God is at work in the world and in God's kingdom in ways that are often surprising to us. So come, let's enter into the mystery of God. Friends, please pray with me. As we worship this morning, O oh God, we pray that your spirit will be our strength. Your word will be our guide. Your love will be our comfort. And your promise will be our hope. This we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Let's worship the Lord.
Sports can be fun. There are so many different types of sports you can play. In any team sport, the players must be chosen. So lots of times, the kids who are the fastest, strongest, or best at the sport will be chosen first. I wonder what's a talent a good baseball player would have. How about a soccer player? Or a hockey player? How about a basketball player? When I was growing up, I loved playing basketball. One of the things that is good when playing basketball is being tall. I was 4 feet 11 inches until after I got out of high school. That is not very tall. I also played softball. One thing that is good when playing softball is being fast. I am not a fast runner. For people who don't have the talents for a particular sport, the part where players are chosen can be sad. We might be afraid we'll be chosen last, or not chosen at all. Our story today kind of reminds me of the choosing part of sports. In 1 Samuel 16, God had decided to choose a new king for Israel. He told the prophet Samuel to go to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse. God knew exactly who he was going to choose. So Samuel listened, and he told Jesse to bring his sons so that God could tell him which one God had chosen. Jesse brought in seven sons. As each of Jesse's sons passed by, God told Samuel that he was not the one. Samuel could not understand it. They were all such handsome men and very strong. Surely one of them was the king God had chosen. But God said to Samuel, Don't consider his looks. I have rejected him. Man looks at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. After seven of Jesse's sons had passed before him, there were no more sons in the house. So Samuel asked, Are these all of the sons you have? It turns out Jesse had a son who was still a boy, and he was taking care of the sheep. Samuel had Jesse call this son in, and his name was David. When David came in, God said, He is the one. So Samuel anointed him with oil. He wasn't the oldest. He wasn't the tallest, and he wasn't the strongest. But God chose him to be king because God does not look just on the outside, but God looks at the heart. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to remember how much you love us. You don't love us because of how big we are or what we look, at, look, look like. You love us, and you look at our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Oh, the name of Jesus Yeah, the name of Jesus Good morning. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first scripture lesson comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Listen for the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's appointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all of your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we shall not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then sent out to Ramah. Our second lesson comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. Please stand as you are able for reading of the Gospel. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Don't you love a good surprise? I qualify that with good because sometimes surprises just aren't. Like during the recent winter shutdown when water came gushing through our bathroom vents because the pipes to the water heater in the attic burst in the freeze. Good surprises, on the other hand, can be the best. 
I've been reading good news stories again, and time and again, you will find people that are kind and generous if you just pay attention. Take, for example, Crystal and Patrick Dehaney. They're a young couple with two children and a third on the way. And after they had their first baby, they realized just how expensive babies can be. Yep. And then those babies just keep growing, and they weren't wanting to eat, and they need a ton of things like a roof over their heads to survive. Well, with their third baby on the way, the Dehaney's realized just how much more expensive baby items are now. And with the pandemic on top of that, families can be struggling to provide even the basic necessities for their babies. And Crystal and Patrick are a little better off financially than they were with their first child. So they took about $1,000 and spent a day putting money into diaper boxes and under formula lids in targets in the Los Angeles area. And they're hoping these surprises will help someone out who may be in need. Crystal commented, when we were new parents, the saying, it takes a village, really rang true. Our neighbors, coworkers, friends, family members showered us with meals and pitched in to help with yard work and so much more. It was so amazing to feel supported and to know that there were people out there that cared. I wanted other parents who may be feeling alone to know someone out there cares about them. Well, Dehaney says it's her hope that the parents who find her hidden gifts not only feel supported, but also pay that act of kindness forward. I hope they help others that are in need, she said. The world needs more kindness, and I'm hoping our video inspired others to spread joy and kindness wherever they go. Now imagine with me, if you will, that you are a new parent struggling to pay for a box of diapers. But you do. And when it's time to change the baby, you discover a little bit of cash in that box. It would be so random, so unexpected, and so appreciated. Well, in today's scripture, Jesus compares the kingdom of God with seed in two different ways. The first suggesting that God is at work bringing forth fruit from seed in ways that are still mysterious no matter how often you see a seed break triumphantly through the earth. We might be instrumental in putting that seed in the ground, but we do not control its growth from within. Within scattered seed is possibility that we cannot see until harvest time. And at harvest time, we grab our sickles and our berry baskets and we gather in the produce. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself the first the stalk and then the head and then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. I once served a small church northwest of Austin, and one of the ministries of the church was visiting the nursing home and providing worship with Holy Communion to the residents. We loved doing that work together, and afterwards we'd all go out to lunch together. And one such time, probably around this time of year, there was talk of what had been planted and what was being harvested in our gardens, tomatoes and peppers, zucchini and squash. And there were so many different varieties, and some of us would sell their produce at the local farmer's market. One woman talked about dumping her compost pile in one plot of her garden, and all kinds of things started coming up unexpectedly and randomly. Cantaloupes and zucchini and tomatoes, they were all just growing wildly together in this space, in this one little plot of garden space. And it was beautiful. It was certainly not planned. Surprise! Jesus continues with a parable, a way of storytelling that sheds a fuller, fuller light on the point he's trying to make. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, he says. It seems inconsequential as you look at other larger seeds, and yet it grows into a magnificent bush sufficient for birds to make their homes in it. It's a common bush, really, and to think that the kingdom of God might be compared to that should make us stop and consider the mystery of that. Is the kingdom of God really found in something as common and as small as the smallest of seeds? Even from the tiniest of beginnings come great and magnificent things. So it is in God's kingdom. Surprise! I have some surprises from my garden. Some are not so great since many seedlings did not flourish over time. But I have a harvest of tomatoes. Aren't they beautiful? My confession is I didn't start these from seeds, but purchased a couple of plants at HEB. 
but I also have two avocado trees sprouting from seeds that I placed in the ground months ago. One's in a pot and one is in the ground, and I can't wait to see how they might flourish. The kingdom of God is like that. We don't know how the seeds grow. We don't cause them to grow, though we can certainly help nurture their growth. All we know is that God is good, and we get to enjoy the harvest that God provides. Our first scripture this morning was from 1 Samuel, which told the story of God sending Samuel to anoint the next king of Israel. It's a story many remember from their Sunday school days. Samuel shows up at Jesse's house in Bethlehem and asks to see his sons, for the Lord has determined that the next king would arise out of his house. And son after son passed before Samuel, but the Lord has not found favor with any of them, even though some of them were quite handsome. God looks at what is on the inside of one's heart when determining character. This too was the case in discerning the next king of Israel. Samuel asks if there are other sons, perhaps, that he missed, and Jesse tells them of his youngest son, David, who's away tending the sheep. And once David is sent for and passed before Samuel, Samuel anoints him, this youngest son, as the next king of Israel. Not the strongest or the mightiest, but the youngest and the least likely candidate for king in comparison to the other sons, at least from our human perspective. That's how God surprises us, by choosing the least likely to accomplish great things. In the life of the church, we wonder at times if what we do is impacting lives, is healing, is transforming lives for the transformation of the world. It's hard to see how seeds we've planted so many years ago might come to flourish, especially during the pandemic when everything shut down and even now as we slowly but surely loosening are loosening our safety protocols. Gil Rendell is a United Methodist pastor and author and consultant in areas of church leadership. And he once told the story of a downtown church in Pennsylvania on uh, the downside of its ministries with declining membership as people and their their contributions moved out of the inner city and into the suburbs. They were losing their focus for ministry and ministry while the neighborhood around them was changing. But there was a faithful group of older gentlemen who continued to meet weekly for prayer. They were probably in their 70s and beyond. And one snowy Advent evening, a 12-year-old boy knocked on the door of the church and asked to come in. He wondered what they were doing. And the pastor told him that they were having a time of prayer and he was welcome to come and stay and pray with them if he wanted to. And so the boy pulled up a chair and joined this old men's prayer group. And a little later, there was another knock at the door and it was two more boys about 12 years old who asked if so-and-so was inside and the pastor said yes. And they asked him to tell him to come back outside. And the pastor told the boys he was not going to do that, but if they wanted to come in, they were welcome. He told them what they were doing, and if they wanted to stay and lift up some prayers with the group, they could join them. And so they came in too. And from that time of prayer with older gentlemen, they learned that these young boys had really a difficult uh, lives. They were facing situations that no 12-year-old should have to face. And they began to mentor these boys and raise them up in the faith. And whenever the church people said that they didn't have enough money or resources, or time, or people to do the work of God, someone would say, remember that snowy Advent night when there was a knock at the door? They learned once again that the church is God's, and God is at work in the small and mysterious ways, bearing fruit for the kingdom. The church learned how to reframe their story of how God was and is at work in the church. Not only did the young boys find safe place to share their lives and their problems with these older brothers in Christ, the church found new breath of life and a new purpose in doing ministry for a younger generation in need of godly role models. That's how God surprises us. Who would have thought that a few 12-year-old boys could help the church discern its next direction for ministry? I've seen God at work in this church in mysterious ways, touching lives and equipping people for ministry, bringing forth ministries. I see it in the way that Vacation Bible School is coming together with our volunteers stepping up in countless ways and undergoing the required safe gathering training that is necessary when we're working with children and youth. 
I saw it when our brown bag Bible study group came back together first at the park because it was just time to come back together in fellowship and in laughter and study and prayer and now even food. I see how the relationships are being built and rebuilt all to the glory of God. I see how they've accepted the challenge to be our test group in setting small group guidelines as the church continues to discern each next baby step and reopening for other groups and events. I see food items just appear in the kitchen, and I know that many are out shopping and donating essential groceries and stocking the shelves and countertops so that those that are food insecure in our community can have that stress of not knowing where their next meal is coming from taken away from them when they come to the food pantry. God has a way of showing up and surprising us, working things all together for the good of the kingdom. We learn something else at the end of our passage today. Yes, we learn that the word of God is also like seed that is scattered. Jesus continued to teach the word of the kingdom of God in parables, making connections between everyday, ordinary things and the way in which God is mysteriously at work ushering in the kingdom in and through Jesus. And as followers of Christ, we are also called to sow seeds of God's word into our world. What we say and what we do may seem inconsequential to us, but God is mysteriously at work bringing great things, fruitful things to life. We don't know how. But most assuredly, fully expect to be surprised as we continue to throw seeds in faithfulness and in thanksgiving for all that God has in store. Amen. Amen. breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son Yeah. Hey.
thank you for worshiping with us today. We pray our time together has been a blessing to you. Please remember to like this recorded worship service on Facebook or YouTube and share this with your friends. This is how we are growing our online community of faith. A reminder that we have resumed in-person indoor worship at 10 a.m. each Sunday. If you are looking for a church home in the Bastrop Cedar Creek area, we would love for you to visit. Our Sunday school class meets at 1 p.m. each Sunday via Zoom. Please contact the church office at 512-303-1393 for the meeting details. Vacation Bible School, Knights of the North Cathel, will be July 12th through 14th from 6.15 to 7.45 p.m. and is for ages 3 through the completion of 4th grade. Our registration is now open to the community and space is limited. Please go to our website at cedarcreekumc.org to register. The Cedar Creek United Methodist Church Food Pantry is open on the 2nd and 4th Wednesdays of every month from 9 till noon. Mark your calendar for the next distribution on June 23rd. If you or someone you know is in need of groceries, please extend the invitation to stop by. Our cupboards are full. Thank you for all who uphold Cedar Creek with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service and witness. If you would like to give to Cedar Creek United Methodist Church financially, you may do so electronically via our website at cedarcreekumc.org. Or you may mail a check to the office at P.O. Box 33, Cedar Creek, Texas, 78612. Remember that there are fees involved in online giving for which you are responsible. Your offerings support the mission and ministries of the church and are greatly appreciated. Know we are praying for you, and I hope you are praying for Cedar Creek UMC as well. Receive this blessing as we say goodbye. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and always. Amen. This is unfailing love.